few weeks ago that uh, the old gal, she didn't have a tooth in her head, but I tell you what, she could play the spoons. And she was playing with another guy that was playing, uh, I think, a guitar. Or, no, it was a, a banjo. Wow. I mean, she was tearing it up. And, uh, you just never know. There's a lot of instruments and a lot of instruments to be played. Um, am I a little bit loud? It seems like I am to me. If you gotta, yeah, turn me down just a little bit. Is that better? Okay. Uh, I, who knows? I might want to raise my voice. And if I do, I don't want to bust the eardrums, okay? I, y'all thought I was going to move my Billy Graham in prison. But, uh, all right, today we uh, will come to you from the book of Joel. And uh, I've not preached from this book before. This uh, one of the minor prophets. And again, uh, we call them minor not because they were of less import- lesser importance, but because they were smaller, they are a smaller book. Um, there's 12 uh, minor prophets. So. Uh, we were in Hosea uh, for a couple of weeks, and we're uh, in Joel now, and it's a little different. I'm telling you, I, a little different than I expected when I started studying this book. I was a little uh, confused at first about his uh, prophecy, and uh, and then what was for his uh, here and now versus what he was uh, given as prophecy, and I I've come to find out and learn, and I'm learning as uh, as I'm I'm trying to learn and teach you as well. But uh, I have learned that Joel was really presenting two messages here in this book. He presented the message about the locust and uh, the plague of locusts that was coming and had uh, apparently had already been affecting the people, and then the future message about the day of the Lord. You all familiar with that term? We've had it throughout Scripture, uh, the day of the Lord. Joel mentions it several times in this little book of the day of the Lord. When you hear the day of the Lord, most times it's, it's talking about uh, the, uh, the end times, talking about that day when, when after the rapture takes place, the seven years of tribulation, and then... Uh, uh, God's judgment here on earth. So uh, when you hear that term, it's uh, it's coming judgment. Uh, Joel describes the destruction of the locusts and the famine in the land, but but then he he looks past that to the to the current heartaches and desolation, and he literally talks about a Gentile army that has come against. Uh, the nation of Israel. And, of course, this is a tool of God to correct His people. He is, uh, I wouldn't go as far as to say this was an army that represented God, but I would say that God used other armies to to uh, correct His people. And would you believe today that uh, there are certain things that come into our lives that, that that's horrible? There are certain things that happen to us that are horrible, but God can use them. Do you agree with that? God can use anything to to allow in our lives to correct us and to bring us back in to a right relationship with Him. Uh, that's much of what we, we see in this book. The uh, locust, uh, by the way, and if you're not familiar, how, how many know, uh, got a good idea what locusts are? I, I was uh, talking to uh, Bella a little bit this morning about uh, the locusts and the video I'm going to show you here in just a moment uh, or what she'll put up on the screen. It, dry fly. Well, define, they're defined like this. A swarming, leaping insect capable of causing great devastation to crops and other plant plant life. In the Exodus story, and you all familiar with that, I'm sure the, uh, most are, there were locusts overrun, where the locusts overran Egypt and uh, during that eighth plague. And then uh, they're also called, uh, in, in different forms, uh, called or maybe called canker worm or grasshopper, hopping locust, katydid, palmer worm. All those are forms of, of uh, locusts. Here in Joel, he talks about four groups, the devouring locusts the swarming locusts, the young locusts, and the destroying locusts. 
I never really thought about it till I got into this passage and, and started reading about how uh, devastating they are. And I know they would, they'll eat up all the crops, but we don't think a lot of times if we haven't been affected directly, we don't think about the direct effects or the after effects of something like this. Uh, by the way, there's some 90, listen to this, 90 varieties of locusts, and all of them are well able to ruin a whole nation. Uh, in Joel 1, starting in uh, verse 2, bring up verse 2. Hear this, you elders. Listen, all you inhabitants of the land. Has anything like this ever happened in your days or in the days of your ancestors? Tell your children about it and let your children tell their children and te their children the next generation. What the, what the devouring, listen to this, the devouring locusts, that's the first group, right? What they have left, the swarming locusts has eaten. The, okay, we're talking about two groups there. The devouring locusts, what they leave behind, the swarming locusts have eaten. What the swarming locusts has left, the young locusts have eaten. And what the young locusts has left, the destroying locusts has eaten. Sounds pretty horrible, doesn't it? Sounds pretty devastating. So devastating that uh, that Joel, he, he tells them to, to basically, in a nutshell, repent. Come back to God. That's the invitation. Uh, repent. Come back to, to God. Mourn over the situation. What, what's so bad is when God starts bringing judgment and man's heart just gets harder. And I fear that the nation of the United States, we have judgment already begun. I sense not only judgment coming, I sense we're on the front edge of it. And uh, I've got more to say about that in just a moment. But I want you to see just a little bit. If, if you would start that video and let's, let's see just a little bit about, this is just a secular video about locusts, but it might help us understand a little bit about the destruction that they can cause. There is no other species on the planet that responds as quickly and as dramatically to the good times as the desert locust. Eggs that have remained in the ground for 20 years begin to hatch. The young locusts are known as hoppers, for at this stage they're flighters. They find new feeding grounds by following the smell of sprouting grass. Normally, it takes four weeks for hoppers to become adults. But when the conditions are right, as now, their development switches to the past. As the vegetation in one place begins to run out, the winged adults release pheromones, scent messages, which tell others in the group that they may move on. And when groups merge, they form a swarm. Tons of vegetation. They have to keep on moving. The 
warm paddles for the wind. It's the most energy saving way of flying. Following the flow of wind means that they're always heading toward areas of low pressure. Places where wind meets rain and vegetation starts to grow. As they fly, swarms join up with other swarms to form a gigantic plague several billion strong and as much as 40 miles wide. They will consume every edible thing that lies in their path. This is one of planet Earth's greatest spectacles. It's rarely seen on this scale, and it won't last long. Once the food is gone, the steady roar of a billion beating locust wings will once again be replaced by nothing more than the sound of the desert wind. Been aware, then that, that's uh, it, it's one of those educational videos about uh, about locusts, and and I had no clue that eggs could stay in the ground for 20 years and then be hatched. It's amazing, isn't it? Uh, when we hear of locusts, we, of course, a lot of us have been taught the plagues of Egypt when God brought His children uh, out of that bondage of uh, and slavery of the Egyptians. I don't know about you, but I think back at the times I've studied about the plagues, you know, every, every time I hear of locusts, that's, that's kind of where I think about it as a judgment of God. Um, there are a lot of, lot of uh, uh, locust swarms that uh, happening right now around the globe. A lot of it in, uh, I think that was in South Africa there. But anyway, uh, they will devastate the crops. Devastate. Animals, livestock, end up with nothing to eat. Uh, Joel, in one of the verses, uh, he he records that the livestock will roam in a roam in the, around in their normal area, and they'll just kind of be walking in circles in confusion because they have nothing to eat, and it's a sad sight. Sad picture, he thinks. So we go on, and we have that, but then uh, he, he moves on to um, talk about the day of the Lord. And in the future, verse uh, 15, I believe it is, uh, he says, Woe because of that day, for the day of the Lord is near and will come as devastation from the Almighty. The phrase, the day of the Lord, refers, as I said a little bit earlier, uh, made reference to this, a time in the future when God will pour out His wrath on the Gentile nations because of their sin against the Jews. Uh, he talks about that in chapter 3, and it also uh, it, 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 it occurs after, or, or the, it will occur after the church has been taken to heaven, of course, we got reference to that in First Thessalonians 1:10, 5, 9, and also Revelation 3:10. Uh, Joel 3, 9 through 17 talks about this uh, day of the Lord. Even talk, it makes reference to the Battle of Armageddon and uh, Jesus Christ returning to the earth to establish His kingdom. Now he goes on in verse 16. He says. Hasn't the food been cut off before our eyes, joy and gladness from the house of our God? The seeds lie shriveled up in their casings. The storehouses are in ruin. The granaries are broken down because the grain has withered away. And here is what I was talking about with the animals. How the animals groan, the herds of cattle wander in confusion since they have no pasture. Even the flocks of sheep suffer punishment. I call to you, Lord, for the fire has consumed the pastures of the wilderness and flames have devoured all the trees of the countryside. Even the wild animals cry out to you. 
for the riverbeds are dried up. Fire has consumed the pastures of the wilderness. Blow the horn in Zion. Sound the alarm on my holy mountain. Let all the residents of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord is coming. In fact, it is near. A day of, the, of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and dents overcast like the dawn spreading over the mountains. Here, I will make uh, it be worth noting that when swarms of locusts come in, it darkens the sky. I mean, it looks like clouds rolling in because locusts can be so thick in the air. I saw one video uh, uh, on YouTube about locusts, and these, these people were driving down the road, and locusts were everywhere. I mean, they were, and, and they were hitting the windshield. I'm, I'm thinking, man, if I see one grasshopper or, or a cricket or something hit my windshield, that it, it makes a mess. These things were ever. It was raining. I mean, they're driving through this thick fog of of uh, locusts. It don't do any good to put your windshield wipers on. It's a mess. And it's hard to even drive through it. And you can hear it clicking and hitting, you know. It's just, it, it, it's almost sickening sounding. I get to thinking also about, you know, I, I don't know how many of you consider yourself animal lovers, but I couldn't help but think, as reading this about the livestock, how much man's sin affects creation. It's so sad. If we really do, do love animals, I'm telling you, we're a lot of, I know a lot of y'all animal lovers. I am, I am too. It breaks you hard to think something innocent has to suffer because of our bad decisions, right? Uh, doesn't it make you angry when you read or, or uh, hear about on the news or something about uh, someone that they have arrested. They finally got somebody, took them to jail because of animal abuse. You know, not too long ago I, I saw this where a, a, some, I, I don't know if it was just a, one single lady or a couple, but they had horses. And I mean the video of those horses real showing. And they were literally starving those horses to death. And, and you see other yeah, and I'm going to go into details. You know, you see, uh, it seems like it's more often now. You you hear of people uh, having these, they hoard, I call it hoarding, cats or dogs in some cases, and these animals. And they literally they have so many they can't take care of them. And they're starving to death. And uh, it's just sad. And you think, that's one thing, but what about our sin? What about when God does bring judgment? All of creation is affected by our sin. All of creation. And it's amazing how, how to look at innocent animals that have to suffer the consequence of man's sinfulness. Here, God's nation being brought to, to judgment because of their sin. And as Larry said earlier, we need to... The invitation is there. The invitation is here in this book. Uh, he talks about the locust plague. He also talks about the day of the Lord and the future coming. But uh, I love I love some of this... Uh, you know, I don't like to focus on the, on the destruction and the plagues and the consequences as much as I do when, when they do return. And God does give an, give an opportunity to come back to Him. And wouldn't it be a horrible heavenly Father? Wouldn't it be a horrible example of, of, a, of a loving Father if He brought judgment in all these cases but never did give an opportunity to repent? Wouldn't that be horrible? I'm telling you, we've got a loving God. We've got a, we have a Heavenly Father who is patient. He is so patient. But judgment is coming. He, uh, he, here, I'm going to read just a little bit here if you'll uh, skip over there with me to uh, uh, verse 18 in, in uh, chapter 2, actually. 
Then the Lord became jealous for His land and spared His people. The Lord answered His people, Look, I'm about to send you grain, new wine, and fresh oil. You will be satiated with them. And I will no longer make you a disgrace among the nations. I will drive the northerner far from you and banish him to a dry and desolate land, his front ranks into the Dead Sea and his rear guard into the Mediterranean Sea. Now, that wouldn't have made much difference to me to read that until I went over there. Uh, and to know the space between the Dead Sea and the Mediterranean Sea. It's a good bit of distance there. So he's giving you a picture of what he's going to do to Israel's enemy. His stench will rise. Yes, his rotten smell will rise. For he has done astonishing things. Don't be afraid, land. Rejoice and be glad. For the Lord has done astonishing things. Don't be afraid, wild animals, for the wilderness pastures have turned green. The trees bear their fruit, and the fig tree and the grapevine yield their riches. Children of Zion, rejoice and be glad in the Lord your God, because He gives you the autumn rain for your vindication. He sends showers for you, both autumn and spring rain as, uh, as before. The threshing floors will be full of grain. Remember where we read where the grain was, was dried up and it wasn't available? Well, now he's restoring that. And the vats will overflow with new wine and fresh oil. And I love this. I've got this highlighted in my Bible. I, if, if you like to highlight stuff, I'd recommend this. But in verse 25, I love this part. I will repay you for the years that the swarming locusts ate. Isn't that a good guy? I heard a man I became friends with was a former church I was a member at, and uh, he told about in his testimony about uh, in his younger days having a really bad drug addiction. He was addicted to cocaine, lost everything, almost everything. Um, his his brother was, was uh, I think, preaching a revival. He said that church little church started praying for him. And he said, I, I was just minding my own business, and I just got overwhelmed. And I felt like I needed to go to that church that night. They were having a special service, prayer meeting or something, and they were on their faces before God calling out his name. Just in case you don't think prayer works, okay? I want to encourage you something. It does. And we, all, we already know that from, from recent prayers being answered. But... It should just encourage us to do more. And as they were crying out to God for this man, this young man at the time, he said, I walked in the back doors of that church and all those people, he said, I heard my name being called out in prayer. And he said, I knew I just had to get up there to God. And not that God has to be up here in the front of the church, but he knew he had to go to that altar. And when he did, the people just flocked to him and, and prayed and lifted him up. And he said, Later on, uh, he said he believed that the difference was made that night in his life. But later on, if best I remember from his story, he was at some gathering and uh, one of the local pastors came up, didn't even know him, came up, put his arm on him and said, Son, you don't know me, but I just want you to know i got a word from God for you. He said, He wants you to know that what the enemy has stolen from you God's going to restore. That's good news. Do you ever think about making so many bad decisions, being in so many bad places that God can't even help you? Well, I'm telling you, He reaches down in the gutter and He helps up those who will turn to Him. And all you got to do is give yourself to Him in total surrender, as Larry explained. Total surrender. Give Him everything. Just give it to Him. And you say, well, I ain't got anything left. Or no, a lot of people, I, had, I just don't have anything left. Well, give Him what you have left, which is you, your heart, your life. You don't have to have finances. 
Give what you got. Give him your debt. Give him everything. And see what he does with it. I'm not here to tell you, I'm not a health and wealth preacher. We've got plenty of them on TV. Uh, but I will tell you this. It, it may not be that God's plan for you is to be healthy and wealthy. You may have sickness for the rest of your life. You say, well, you're not very encouraging. But I just want you to know, the God we serve is the, is the God that is faithful in all things. Okay? He's the one that's faithful when you're, when you're hurting and you're physically at a disadvantage. When you're physically in a shape where you can't go any further. God is just as faithful there as He is when you're feeling great and at 100% health. And everything in between. My God is not limited. Listen, I want you to hear this. My God is not limited to my finances. He's not limited to my health. He's the same God whether He and I... Hey, when you know you're walking with the Lord, it's when things are not going the way you want it to go, and you get to walking with Him in the middle of that challenge and those trials, and then you realize, wow, I just learned so much about Him. I learned that He wants to be my Heavenly Father, and He wants to be close to me, and He wants me to depend on Him, and He wants to walk with me. I'm telling you, if we'll realize who we are in Christ, you know that's the biggest challenge now to teach children and youth growing up because our culture teaches them the right to opposite. The, our culture teaches them it's all, about, it's, it's, it's all about this. You know, it's all about being in front of people and how many people get to see them and look at them. And they make it a universe that's supposed to all revolve around an individual. You know, when we get born, when we are born again, our world is turned upside down, but it should be what we really should see it as being turned right side up because we're really getting to see a view of what we're supposed to see, and all of a sudden we're starting to understand, you know what? It's not only the universe doesn't revolve around me, but it revolves around Him. And He's the one that wants to live in and through me. That's good news. Because He's not limited to my health. He's not limited to my wealth or the lack thereof. He is God in all things. All things, all situations. And I'm telling you, these, the, these, these people, I don't care who they are. It may be, they may be preaching to hundreds of thousands or millions of people every Sunday. But if they're telling people that the only way you're going to have full joy is to experience the wealth that He has, that He wants to give to you, and they focused on all that kind of garbage, and I do mean garbage. That wasn't an accident. That's garbage. They're lying to people. They're making them feel good. And it's all about emotions. It's all about emotions, how good they feel about themselves. We don't know how to accurately feel about ourselves until we realize who we are in Christ. Who we are, who the Bible says we are. We're sinners saved by grace. We don't know how much to think, how highly to think of God until we think how lowly we're supposed to know about ourselves. And I don't mean walk around beating ourselves up. No. The only way we can experience God's blessings is to know what He saved us from. And how He lifts us up. He's the one that gives us self-esteem. He's the one that shows us who we are in Him. And it's all everything revolves around Him. He is the reason we live. We don't live to gain wealth. We don't live based on how healthy we are. I didn't mean to say any of that, but uh, somebody apparently needs to hear that. And it does, it does go along with these prophecies. I don't know how health and wealth preachers handle, first of all, what we dealt with a few weeks ago in the thorn in the flesh by the Apostle Paul. I don't know how they deal with that. I, don't know, they, I think I know how they deal with it. They avoid it. 
And, and, and these prophecies of the Old Testament, I, I think they probably avoid those too. Because God is the most interested in our hearts. And there is, I can't find it right off, I may have read it already, I'm not, I'm not sure where I am, I am here. <laughs> but when, when, uh, when Joel writes that the, the, for the people of God, the, the Israel, the nation of Israel at the time, they had rejected God so much. Now God is bringing judgment. And He's also talking about in the future the, the Lord's day. But he's also, he's also encouraging them because here God it has, been, it has, has come a, a turn in events. What has been the change? They've repented and turned back to God. I love that how he restores the years, though. I, that's where I was. I didn't finish that passage, did I? Uh, I will repay you for the years that the swarming locust ate. The young locust, the destroying locust, and the devouring locust. My great army that I sent against you. You will have plenty to eat and be satisfied. You will praise the name of the Lord your God who has dealt wondrously with you. My people will never again be put to shame. Boy, that's a, isn't that good? Good news there, isn't it? You will know that I am present in Israel and that I am the Lord your God and there is no other. My people will never again be put to shame. Now, we've got to finish that up uh, or, or step to another step here about dealing with the Holy Spirit uh, or the Spirit acted in a different way here in the Old Testament, but still, uh, it's still God's Spirit. Verse 28, After this I will pour out My Spirit on all humanity. Then your sons and your daughters will prophesy, your old men will have dreams, and your young men will see visions. And it's believed that this happened on the day of Pentecost. How God just poured out. And so here again, Joel is telling us about, at this point in time, about something in the future that's going to take place. I will even pour out my spirit on the male and female slaves in those days. You go on down, the sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood. But the great and terrible day of the Lord comes. He's talking about the day of the Lord again. Then everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved, for there will be an escape for those on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem, as the Lord promised, among the survivors the Lord calls. Do you ever feel like your life is it that you're literally experiencing God's judgment? Do you ever feel like you're in the middle of maybe God judging you? I I know of some people, more than one, that have had life threatening diseases. And uh, they immediately turn to their past, and they make comments like, "I believe God's jud- I-, I believe God is punishing me." And while there are consequences to our sins, I don't know that that's always the exact case for those individuals. But I just try to encourage them. Well, how how is your relationship with the Lord right now? It may be that, it could be that God's using a sickness to bring you back to Him if, you're, if you've strayed from Him. Do you belong to Him, first of all? Are you a child of God? If you are, are you walking with Him? Do you have that relationship with Him? What is, I guess the main response is that I try to give people is, that's not something I can tell you. God hasn't told me. Yes, He's bringing, He's punishing you, or He's bringing judgment. That's, and that's two different issues, by the way. It's not a punishment as much as judgment. In some cases, I believe that individuals experience some things that could be consequences of sin. 
we can make decisions today that affects our literal health, our bodies, tomorrow, right? That's pretty easy to figure out, isn't it? There's certain things we can do to abuse our bodies that it can it affect us in the future or maybe affecting us now. But spiritually speaking, I just believe God is patiently, right now anyway, patiently giving His invitation and waiting for your response. Waiting for my response. If our hearts are far from Him, we still live in a time right now. God's judgment could have already started on us as a nation or in our world today, very likely. But my concern more is not in that area as much right now of individuals that God is placing in my path and in our church family, and I want you to have joy. Do you know that God could literally be bringing judgment on the nation, the United States, but you can still live in joy? Did you know that? Yes. So we need to turn to Him. Whatever the situation, we don't have control of those things, but i tell you what we do have control of, getting on our knees and crying out to Him, and crying out to Him on the behalf of our nation, crying out to Him on the behalf of our church family, crying out to Him on the behalf of our neighbors and friends, and especially crying out to Him on behalf of our spouses and our children and our grandchildren and our great-grandchildren. I'm telling you, we need to be crying out to God. We spend less time arguing about politics, arguing about how things are or who caused it or what's going on and cry out to God, God, forgive us because we're all guilty. We're guilty of turning our backs on you. We're guilty of, of, of not crying out to Him. So we need to cry out to Him. You know, it could be as simple as this return our love to Him for His love that's already been shown. I don't want to oversimplify it, but that, it really is that simple in repentance. Acknowledging what your sin is, turn away from it, and give yourself to Him. It's that simple. Now, what keeps us from that? Selfish desires, feeding our flesh, what keeps us from fasting and praying? Oh, no, this is I'm preaching to myself. What keeps us from fasting and praying? Feeding our flesh. And that's not just food. That's feeding our flesh is a picture of physical and also the spiritual. And it goes hand in hand. When are we going to just be obedient. Walk with Him. Trust Him. Thank Him. Boy, this time of this time of year, I really love this because I, I really believe November is one of my favorite months, if not the favorite month. It, 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 of course, now everybody starts focusing on Christmas, and Christmas kind of gets messed up sometimes because of the commercialism. But Thanksgiving. I don't know. God has just put on my heart, if we, if we are grateful, He has a lot more to work with when we have a grateful heart. You know, have you ever realized the, the people that's the most fun to be around and the people that you enjoy the most are the people that have the grateful heart? You ever thought about that? You say, well, you know, that, that person, it seems like they just have a a smile on their face most of the time. If they do, I bet you they're grateful. Most of the time, they're probably... I know some people just smile more than others, but most people that have that countenance that God's placed on their face, it's because they are grateful to Him for what He has done for them. This time of year is special. And how does that tie in with the prophecy of Joel? We can't turn to Him in full repentance and, and, and surrender to Him without, without having a grateful heart. 
if we're not grateful for what He's already done, we're most likely not going to deal with our sin today. We should, we should be grateful to Him, thanking Him, praising Him for what He's done. And by the way, when we start praising Him, we start thanking Him, living with a grateful heart, Larry's not going to have to nudge anybody the same. We'll be singing. We'll be singing from the time we come in the door probably to the time we leave. We, we will be singing and nobody can stop us because we're so grateful. You know, ever, felt, ever felt so good you couldn't hardly stand it? You ever felt so good that other people couldn't stand you? No, I shouldn't say that. Uh, everybody stand where you are. Ever what your need is,